Hey everyone, in my recent video where I looked at my new cohort based model, I had some people asking about the loss ratio and specifically the lifetime loss ratio. And I wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page and understanding what the lifetime loss ratio is versus just a quarters loss ratio because there is a difference there, somewhat of a difference. And then I also want to show an improvement I made to this cohort model at least in the accuracy of the model and show you what results that had. So let's listen to Daniel for a moment. The first is that we are seeing it in the numbers. It depends which numbers we look at. So we had a 94% loss ratio in Q3, but based on all the data we have, the business that we wrote in Q3 will have a lifetime loss ratio of 61. So the first point to understand is, are we looking at lagging indicators, which are the financials that we report quarterly, or leading indicators. And in a fast-growing business, you just saw literally on a map how much has changed in the last couple of years for Lemonade. But so much of our current financials is a result of what happened a year, two, and three ago. So look at leading indicators rather than lagging indicators, and you'll get a diametrically opposite picture. I want to delay on this one for a second. I spoke about the LTV model. Part of that model, it produces LTV, but on its way, it produces an expected lifetime loss ratio. Lifetime loss ratios are important because loss ratios tend to be front heavy. Customers have the most claims, the worst loss ratio in their first year, gets a bit better in the second year. In our experience, they tend to be around their lifetime average loss ratio in the third year, and then they go below it in years four and five. When you're selling business, you want to think about long-term profitability of the business. You don't care if they are loss-making in the first few months. You want to think about will they be loss-making in a meaningful way over their lifetime. So you want to be forward-looking, not looking at a snapshot right now. And the machine learning model does all of that. And what it is showing you on the screen here to, right now is that in Q1 of 21, the cohort that we onboarded, not the totality of our business, the business that we sold in Q1 21, on aggregate across all of our products, the machine forecasted a lifetime loss ratio of 86%. And you can see how quarter on quarter on quarter, it has dropped precipitously to the low 60s, to 61% in this past quarter. So there is nothing at all inconsistent with saying that our actual reported lagging loss ratio was one number, and the new business that we were writing was something quite different. The loss ratio of the people that we sold policies in Q3 didn't impact our Q3 loss ratio almost at all. As Daniel mentioned, a lifetime loss ratio would be the average loss ratio across a cohort across all time. And in this cohort-based model, I have each cohort, basically each quarter of customers, they sign up and their amount of gross profit over time as it as they churn away. So it starts at a higher value and then churns away over time and I've stacked that up quarter by quarter so that on the side here we can get a sum of all previous quarters at a specific point in time. But in that video that I, where I showed this model I used the lifetime loss ratio which would be the average loss ratio over the entire life of this cohort. But the current loss ratio that Lemonade would release would be more based on this, where you're looking at all previous quarters plus the newest quarter uh, cohort of customers. And these customers right here in the newest quarter, for example, they might be the very they might have a higher loss ratio than they would next year or next quarter or the quarter after the quarter after eventually these, these this cohort would improve over time so it's an important distinction if whether you're considering the average lifetime loss ratio of a cohort or you're thinking about the entire pool of customers including the newest customers where these customers are a little bit riskier or some of them you're still going to cancel as the insurer uh, and so they have a higher loss ratio than they would, you know, a couple years from now. And I also started thinking about my own model and thinking, well, it'd be better if rather than uh, have just using that average consistently across it, it'd be better if I could apply a loss ratio function uh, that would show the, the descent or decline in loss ratio or improvement in loss ratio over time. And what does that curve look like? We're taking a bit of a stab or guess at that, but we do have a bit of information. We know that in about year, end of year two, beginning of year three, the average 
the lifetime loss ratio is equal to the current loss ratio for a specific quarter. So that gives us a key piece of information. We also could maybe take a guess on where the loss ratio is starting for some of the quarters, at least going into the future, based on some of the slides at Investor Day. And we also know some of these average lifetime values, which can help us calculate what a curve might look like. And I was chatting with Domine on Twitter about what this function might look like. And he was suggesting it might look like a exponential declining function that would hit an, an asymptote over time. Basically, it would, as enough time went by, the loss ratio would get better and better, but it would only maybe get so better as a maybe a certain amount. Maybe, maybe that's 50%, maybe 60%, maybe that's 30%. The overall asymptote for a cohort of customers would only get to a certain point. I thought that made sense, so I went about finding what that exponential function could look like. All the details of the math are maybe not too important unless you're really interested in that. But I used Wolfram Alpha and basically said, okay, if you have the amount of gross profit on one side where you're using the average loss ratio of say 61% from investor day, and you put that in the form of the average profit over time, but right here you're solving for the exponential function that could um, that the loss ratio curve might look like. You can then get a value based on what that exponential function curve could look like, a value of x over n quarters. And I played, I probably spent too much time looking at possible functions that this could meet, but I found one that worked really nicely where if you have, if you start with 70% loss ratio for new business, I'll explain why I think that's a good value in a moment, and it levels out to 58% asymptote over time, or basically that cohort of customers, say a new customers starting this Q2 or Q3 of this year would at best, you know, years from now, several years from now, level out to 58%, uh, it gives you a value for X. And then you have your entire loss ratio function right here for what that could look like. And I plotted that on a graph. You can see in this black line right here, and there's the function. That would start where it starts at 70%. So right away, your loss ratio for new business for a cohort is 70%. And then this one fit really nicely because after eight quarters or two years, then we get down to about 62.8. And then between two-year mark and three-year mark, we were hitting that 61% range, which is what the lifetime average was. Um, predicting and then beyond there it gets continually better and better so at the point you're at you know 20 quarters or four years of time you're at 59 percent you zoom out to 10 years time you're at 58 percent and that'll just keep tracking down to 58 percent so I added that function then into my model and I called that here cohort with loss ratio to asymptote and added in some details here where I could put in uh, the lifetime loss ratio, the initial loss ratio, this exponential function or x that we solved for from Wolfram, and where the it terminates to. So going into the future, I use those same values where it's 70%, 58%, and 61%. And I think the 70% for new business, that's uh, as the initial loss ratio, is a good uh, value because if you look at investor day, they have a few examples where they're talking about, for example, pets, and they're saying 60% of what their loss ratio for Q3 cohort is 60% loss ratio. Now that would be, my understanding would be not the lifetime loss ratio, but the initial loss ratio for pets for that quarter. Now how many pets are there and what's the exact breakdown of premium for pets or others? We don't know that breakdown entirely. But if we also flip to uh, home, there's 81%. So it's a higher ratio, probably much less customers in here versus all the other customers, but a higher amount, a good chunk of premium still, but at 81%, they're predicting a loss ratio for October. And then if I look at 
the next result would be renters. Renters are extremely profitable, and there's 1.4 million renters, so a ton of renters, a large part of their of their customer base, and they're predicting 51% loss ratio. So you have some average between 50% and 80% is my guess, is where the new business is coming in at a loss ratio. So that's my guess why 70% was a good initial number, and also why, I know it was nice that that fit that curve, that plot, basically exactly to the data that we had. Apply that same loss ratio, function, loss ratio function to every quarter into the future, as well as solving for various other cases into the past where you had different uh, initial loss ratios and where I guessed at that, and also a different lifetime loss ratio based on some of those values given at investor day. Put that all into my model here, and what it does is it does make things a little bit worse than we were cash flow wise. Because for every quarter, you're having less profit up front and then more profit potentially later. Or you're shifting that balance, right, to hit that overall average lifetime loss ratio. So you have less right away, but then more later. So if you look at where I was before I added in this function, I had. <clears throat> with six quarters of synthetic agents turned on. Again, if you want to play with this model yourself, you can support the channel on my Patreon and get full access. Before I had 2026 profitability, 2027, we had about 225 million. This is with 2% quarter over quarter OPEX change and also top line growth of after the synthetic agents effect having about 10% per quarter growth. But with the loss ratio function applied, same amount of same inputs otherwise we are looking at actually profitability in 2027 and 125 million. So it shifts it back a little bit if you flip back and forth between the two. Not a huge effect, but definitely a bit more of a negative effect. Now, a few ways we could play with the model and see, you know, to try and see when they may become profitable would be, of course, changing the top line growth, how much that might change. Also changing the amount of synthetic agents. Maybe they add on another term of synthetic agents. Maybe it's more aggressive amount of synthetic agent spend. You could also wonder whether the operating expenses are really going to grow 2% per quarter. Maybe it's going to be more than that. Maybe it's even better than that, which would be ideal. Another big metric is what I'm calling the CAC to IFP conversion. In other words, what do they spend for $1 of customer acquisition? What, kind, what amount of Inforce premium are they getting? But I was thinking about it the other day, and that value should actually keep increasing over time because you have more customers that can sign up and bundle multiple products, maybe instead of just buying the renter's insurance. Now car insurance is available in their state, so they also buy a car insurance product. So this this ratio could could rise pretty dramatically could go from a three to a four or five six i would even imagine over the next few years as they build out really build out the product lineups and push the product lineups in the states that they're in as well as customers who are younger and start to get older and just naturally need more insurance as they get older uh, would just bundle and buy more products that they may need so that's going to increase your uh, top line ifp significantly without with very little, with no changes in your marketing spend. So then for the same amount of marketing spend, you could have a much higher ratio of IFP coming in. And it was interesting, I tweeted this out that, I read this in their S1, that back in 2020, around the time of the S1, they said they get $2 of Inforce premium for $1 of marketing investment. But now, of course, that ratio is closer to three or even above three. So all these factors can make a big guess as to when profitability will come. My plan is to try and make this model as accurate as possible, especially as each quarter uh, results come in, we'll be at the clearer and clearer picture of how things are looking. But before Q2 results come out, I plan to do what my most realistic case might be from this cohort based model and then drive some of those the top line growth numbers from that uh, into my previous model I call current model on here where I break down all each line of operating expenses and I'll present that to you all before uh, Q2 results come in and if you want to support the channel get full access to this and play with these inputs yourself feel free to join my patreon thank you so much for watching and remember it's in the bag